here. Um, we're super thrilled that you all could join us this evening. My name is Tyler Blackwell. I'm the Cynthia Woods Mitchell Associate Curator here at the Blaffer Art Museum at the University of Houston, if we have not met. Um, it's been my privilege and honor to work with Molly over the last three and a half years uh, to realize the career survey exhibition that is currently on view at the museum, uh, which features over 100 objects. Um, I think something like 123 objects uh, made over the last 20 years. Um, the exhibition, which is still on view through March 13th, if you would like to spend more time in it, or if you've not had a chance to make it into the museum just yet, um, is also accompanied by, um, I have to plug <laughs> our catalog here. Um, <laughs> A super, a super gorgeous 220-page uh, um, catalog that we have co-published uh, with Inventory Press in Los Angeles. Um, this book and then our, our uh, uh, other recent Jamal Cyrus exhibition catalog are the first books that we've um, published in a number of years, so we're really thrilled. Um, if you already have a copy of this catalog, I'm sure Molly would be happy to uh, sign it. I'm going to volunteer her for that. Um, <laughs> We're uh, super grateful uh, to Lester Marks and Penelope Marks, uh, Hedgy and Brian Black, Marilyn and Larry Fields, Sandra and Jack Guthman, Shirley and John Olar, as well as Rachel Uffner Gallery and Corbett versus Dempsey in Chicago for their generous support of this exhibition and of the publication. Um, now for a very brief introduction of Molly. Um, if you don't know her. In Molly's formative years, Molly participated in Riot Girl, uh, which was the 1990s underground punk scene that originated in the Pacific Northwest. Um, the scene really advocated and proposed radical female empowerment through collaborative community building and the rejection of male-dominated power structures. This involvement um, which we propose in the, or I should say I propose in the exhibition, um, had a lasting effect on Molly, instilling within her a permanent inclination towards inquiry and critique, as well as a deep-rooted sense of creative resistance to societal boundaries, cultural norms, and conventional aesthetics. Since the mid-2000s, Molly has primarily identified as a painter, often rethinking, performing, or activating various aspects of the medium's long history, uh, as well as its various visual languages and critical strategies as a starting place for her own socially conscious practice. From 2015 to 2021, she served as senior faculty in painting and printmaking at the Yale University School of Art, and her work is held in a number of major public art collections, including the Aspen Art Museum, the DePaul University Art Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago and the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. In 2014, Molly was included in the Whitney Biennial and she is a 2013 recipient of the uh, Louis Comfort Tiffany Grant. Molly co-founded the great artist-run space uh, Julius Caesar in Chicago in 2007, which is still active. Um, and she was one of the founding organizers of LadyFest 2000, which is a feminist conference and performance showcase that has been revived in different iterations around the world since. Molly is also a prolific writer and thinker, um, and she has written major texts on Susan Sontag, Michelle Grabner, Carrie Schneider, and Magali Guerin. Everyone, let's please welcome Molly Zuckerman Hartung. Having um, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Tyler. Um, my my gratitude to Tyler just uh, deserves a kind of moment. Um, the whole installation of the show and the run of the show so far. Um, hasn't been easy for Tyler, and for you to do this all during a time um, that wasn't easy for you health-wise has been, I'm like, I was gonna take a sip and then, um, 
has been really moving for me and I'm really grateful and I'm just like beyond grateful for the show in the first place um, and I'm very grateful to young men for uh, the immense amount of work and care she put into the installation of the show and uh, to Francesca who's also here for organizing other events and to Dana Frankfurt for organizing other events coordinated with all of this um, and to Chris who's got recording um, down pat <laughs> in, a, in a very impressive way um, allowing me to feel safe despite having a camera and recording devices focused on me. Um, yeah, I'm just really grateful for this show and for the chance that it has given me to, to rethink <laughs> um, everything I've ever thought before, which doesn't, I'm still not quite sure what it means to rethink, but maybe I'll try to say more about that. Um, I've been thinking a lot and rethinking the title of the show, for example, which is Comic Relief. Um, I originally meant it as a way of referring to the uh, bulge or the pressure, density, um, expulsion, <laughs> flaccidity, uh, bodily traits of the paintings, um, the way they are bursting at the seams, the way they're, they're literally materially stacked with uh, gunk and junk of all kinds, including paint. Um, and so I wanted that, that quality of, of two and a half dimensions to be understood and to be understood as, um, as allowing for potentially one affect that that could produce would be laughter. Um, to get a painting to be funny is, is not an easy task. And I wouldn't say that I started with that task. I, I always was trying to make good paintings. Um, but when they failed to be good, I would often discover that something funny had happened. Um, and so I started thinking about humor um, and I think I was actually, I was 37 years old when I really started thinking about humor and I read a biography of Lucille Ball where I found out that she also at age 37 began thinking about humor because she started failing. She had always played uh, romantic leads in films and at age 37 she developed a really intense stutter and had to drop out of the film that she was in at the time. Um, and nobody wanted to work with her anymore because she was too old for romantic leads. Anyway, 37-year-old woman, how could she possibly be loved? <laughs> um, let's hope that was a different time. But her stutter led to somebody buying her tickets to, I think it was Radio City Music Hall, and essentially her beginning to train herself in comedy, which involved um, training herself in self-abuse, basically. She learned how to fall, she learned how to get hurt in every possible way, um, and she became the, the legend that we all know as Lucille Ball. Um, that meant a lot to me when I read about it at age 37. And I realized that I hadn't liked humor before that for many reasons. Okay, so both laughter and smiling are connected in French etymology and Old English and German to derision, mockery, or laughing at. Um, my experience of laughter for many years of my life was being laughed at, and so I didn't like laughter. I just recently was talking to my therapist, like maybe even the last session, and I suddenly started talking to her about how COVID um, as things started opening up again and I got to see people that I knew and loved and got to be in rooms with people, I realized that I was like ecstatically laughing with people. And it was like, if I didn't get the joke, it didn't matter. If I didn't hear what was said, if people started laughing, I wanted to laugh with them. My body just was thrilled by getting to laugh with people. 
Um, and this is after a lifetime of feeling defended against laughter, afraid of laughter, worried about laughter, um, always asking, what, 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 did they, what did they say? What did they say? Did you, can you just tell me what they said? I, I don't want to laugh at that. I'm not sure what that was. But suddenly, just um, the chance to be with other bodies and experience the pleasure of laughter um, felt really great. This is a piece, um, it's in the show. It's called Necklace of Smiles. And I made it for an audio tour that Julius Caesar, that gallery that Tyler mentioned. I, um, we were asked to participate in a show at the Hyde Park Art Center in Chicago. And um, so I decided I wanted to make a, an audio tour um, for the show. And so I attached um, headphones to this and recorded the names of every single person I could find on any website um, in, on the internet um, who seemed to live in Chicago and participate in the art scene in one way or another. It's a very large art scene, so it was a very long list. Um, and I just read their names. It was kind of like a, like a roll call. Like, oh, you're, so the idea would be that you would put the headphones on and you would feel addressed eventually. You might hear your name. Um, and meanwhile, you were wearing these smiles, so you didn't have to smile to other people as you walked around the exhibition. And I included King Lear um, for many reasons of my own, but Lear is another word for smile. Okay, so I'm gonna read to you. This, I usually sort of start slow with a lot of preambles and then at some point we start cruising through images quickly. I've been dwelling on the idea of the retrospective. James Hillman and the, the Jungian psychoanalyst wrote, what matters is the little syllable re. That's the most important syllable in psychology. Remember, return, revision, reflect. Maybe the most important of the re words is respect, which means to look again. Three years ago, I was so generously asked by Tyler Blackwell to assist, that's not his word, I'm not sure why I put it in quotes. That's my word. In the process of building a narrative around my work and life. This is very different from being the primary author. This exhibition is co-authored with Tyler, who told me we would try to historicize my work. That is his word. History, according to Willem Flesser, is not circular but linear, and it requires the linear practice of writing. Not just language, talk, or chat, or soundbite, but the long line of writing, of putting things in some kind of linear form. I'm thinking now that I began trying to do this, writing my life, when I was very young, far before I could have been said to have lived much. Now I wonder why. What is the impulse toward narrating one's life? I think when I was young, it was about being unhappy. I was a very unhappy young person. Something had happened to make me unhappy, but what? I was looking for a trauma, a moment around which my sadness congealed. So again, after the opening of this exhibition last Halloween, I began sitting down regularly to write my own story. Maura Davey and others have written that if one looks intently enough at the personal, one will find a connection to the larger story, to other people's stories. Or to put it a different way, James Baldwin wrote, you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. It was books that taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive, who had ever been alive. One event in my childhood which is utterly shared and absolutely particular is puberty. There is a painting in the show from maybe 10 years ago titled Puberty, which for me occurred when I was nine years old. Puberty is an end and a beginning, much like a retrospective. It is an end to childhood, an end to being seen as a child by the world. At age nine, I looked like I was 15, with large breasts and hips and greasy skin and sweaty armpits. I could no longer run fast and play freely. I became horribly self-conscious and full of shame. Since my mind was still full of child desires, but now also filling up with sexual desires, and my body was hailing only unwanted attention, I experienced what is understood as the Cartesian crisis, the mind-body split. Uh, this is this piece, Trauma, um, exhibited at Rachel Effner Gallery in the show Learning Artist, which is the, the show that Tyler saw and decided he wanted to do this show with me. I think it's from 2016. Um, this is Puberty, so the painting on the right, and then this is a, a close-up of the figure in the painting. It's just cut from something. I found it. Um, so yeah, like I said, that painting is about 10, at least 10 years old. 
This is a painting that I just made called Puberty. I started rethinking puberty and wanting to make paintings about it. Um, that little figure there is on the right that's painted is a copy of one of Cezanne's bathers. I gave the little figure longer hair. I'll talk more about the bathers in a minute. And then the, the sort of larger figure that seems to be sort of moving in on that smaller figure is a, a copy of a Picasso from the blue period. Um, the figures on the left are both from record albums, cut from record albums. And the painting is a square and a the size of a record. Uh, nothing is funnier than unhappiness, I grant you that. Yes, yes, it's the most comical thing in the world, and we laugh, we laugh with a will in the beginning. But it's always the same thing. Yes, it's like the funny story we have heard too often. We still find it funny, but we don't laugh anymore. That's Nell from Beckett's Endgame. Um, this is my friend Sarah Pate and I, way back in college at the Evergreen State College, and we made puppets, and we, um, maybe I don't need those for a little while. Uh, we read Absurdist Theater, and we made puppet shows of Absurdist Theater, Ionesco, Beckett, et cetera. So um, that little blonde figure on the left is uh, Simone de Beauvoir, and that's Beckett in the foreground, and I'm not sure who's in the back, actually. It might be Pinter, but we might have weirdly made a Foucault puppet. I'm not sure why. Um, this is a piece I made in Olympia um, for my community at that time. It's called Bath Time for Democracy. Um, it was about six months after 9-11, and we decided to have an exhibition of art in a, like a warehouse kind of show, like a music space that I ran, but we sometimes had art shows. And so I made this kind of bulging image of the earth, and I put it under interrogation lights, and then people came in, and it bulged with glitter and um, salt and now I'm not even remembering what the third substance was, but tears, spectacle. Um, and then I sort of liquid latexed over all the, the continents and so people could come in and use the razor blades that were hanging and slash into it and it would drip. And I was there in the bathtub for four hours um, posing as Mahat um, from the French Revolution. I'd studied the French Revolution in college and this somehow seemed like a good idea to me. Um, <laughs> freaked my mother out <laughs> and it was cold. Um, this is a painting I made in graduate school that I felt was flopping and, and I didn't know what I was doing. I look back and it looks sort of like I was thinking about text and using materiality to make something that kind of read. Um, but at the time I, I felt that it was a failure. I kept working on it, kept working on it. At some point I tied this brick to it which I'd found in the alley um, that said Tiffany and, and I called it the heavy painting. And it sat on the ground because um, it couldn't hang. All right, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overshare a bit. So this is a piece that I made, and I'm not sure if I can read it to you, but maybe I can just explain it. Um, when I was asked to participate in, a, in a, like a gift bag that Three Walls was putting together, my friend Shannon Stratton ran this gallery, Three Walls. And um, so it's called The Value of a Dollar. Oh, 2013, there's the date. The Value of a Dollar. So I went to this coffee shop every day called Atomics. I asked the um, baristas at the coffee shop if they would sell me some of their tips. Um, and so for every tip, every dollar that was in the jar um, that they sold me, I would give them $2 um, for their tip money. Um, and then I, you can see down at the bottom, um, uh, Brooke Canther was my studio assistant for this project, and she was paid one dollar for every two dollars that she glued together. Um, how did it all come together? I always forget. So, how, it, somehow they ended up as five dollars. Oh, of course, right, five dollars. Because each dollar is worth two dollars, and then there's an extra dollar. So, which is the one that I paid Brooke for the labor. Um, and she glued them together and she put her own alchemical mixes into them and then they were displayed um, in these little clay things that I made at the school, SAIC's um, ceramics lab that were the inside of a, like I squeezed the clay to make the inside of a, of a grip. So, and you know, they're the same on both sides. They're, they're glued together so that they have no face, the dollar bill. Um, so anyway, every dollar was worth five dollars. Um, and it was to try to talk about the value of 
the value of a dollar. What does it mean? How do we talk about value? How do we talk about labor? Um, it's also, the dollar bill is actually composed of like, I think it's 25% linen, 75% cotton, and so just, it is, you know, not unlike a painting in its materiality. Um, and then there's Lionel Trilling's definition of a literary idea. When two conflicting feelings are placed together and find a relationship to one another, this relationship can properly be called an idea. This is a Yuta Couture painting that I love. I look at it and think about it all the time. Um, but clearly, you can't be 100% obsessed, 100% painted, 100% electric, 100% spiritual, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a kind of conflict going on that I think is only being expressed as a kind of intense positivity. But I guess that really excites me. <laughs> um, same with this painting. This is a Sue Williams painting that's often up at the Art Institute, and I would see it, I visited it constantly when I was in Chicago for that decade, and I would take students to it. Um, it's very important to me. Um, I chose yellow. <laughs> I think it's called I chose yellow. No, I, maybe it's called It's a New Age, but I think of it as I chose yellow. Um, great painting, Sue Williams. These are some hydras that I drew while I was in school, thinking again about conflicting ideas, an inter interiority that is conflicted, having multiple heads. The hydra is a mythical monster that um, when you chop off, you, when one <laughs> chops off one of her heads, she's of course a fema female monster, um, she grows two more, three more. Um, so uh, problems are often called um, hydra-headed um, when you start to solve problems and you find more problems emerging. I found this image the other day and I was thrilled because this painting is actually in the show. There it is. Um, and I just thought like, oh my God, it was so ugly. And I actually thought this one worked out okay. They don't always. Um, I, I worked in used bookstores for a decade, um, a solid 10 years. And I also worked at Borders at some point in the midst of that, um, Borders Books. We tried to unionize, we failed, I quit, went back to working at like independent bookstores. Um, this is not a bookstore that I worked at, but I am sort of fascinated with how many used bookstores look like this, and I try to visit every single used bookstore in every town that I'm in. Um, I obviously don't quite succeed, but it is one of my true obsessions. Um, and part of what I love about it is that it, there's not that much of a difference between a used bookshop and a, and a hoarding um, psychology. In a, in a, and I say that in a very positive way. Um, okay, this is another long thing. This is a compilation that I put together many years ago and I thought if you're gonna have a mid-career survey, you have to read this, so forgive me. It's a compilation of things that were said about my work in the first 10 years after graduate school. So between 2007, 2017, um, that I think gave me a pretty good idea about what other people were thinking about what I was doing. And it meant a lot to me um, to think about that. Presenting their ambiguity unapologetically and with a visual and historical clarity, Zuckerman Hartung's, can I read it up there? Paintings deftly riffed on the persistent problems of exclusion and or oppression of binary labels, be they abstraction representation or boy girl in art and or life. A slapstick atmosphere of choreographed chaos rules the Chicago artist's sure-footed New York debut. Swollen, shredded, salad bar sneeze guard, slumps, bleach, porn, globs of paint, and whatever else turns up the intensity. Audacious and improvisational, not simply pretty messes, whisper, stretch, slip, and stumble. Hastily drizzled globs of wax, material raptures, intellectual speed bumps and conceptual limits, gooey, viscous, repulsive, sexy physicality, and is also instinctively skept skeptical of its fetishistic power. Delicate patterns are smeared, smudged, smushed. Nothing is sacred. The artist's eccentric, unsteady hand, discordant, overworked, even dragged through the mud. She spews theory like hiccups. Her lectures are packed with information and scatterbrained, so she often pauses, backtracks, and skips forward. Aim for the gut, soggy, doodles in the margins of the Whistler versus Ruskin debate. Productively confusing, as doodles ought to be. Provokes wide-eyed confusion as a way toward knowledge. The pain or pleasure, failure or success of surmounting obstacles in life, work, or the imagination. Armed and dangerous, leery and suspicious, soft and cuddly, anarchic, experimental sexuality, me meticulously measuring, orgasmic splash and drip, moist, relaxed, chromatically fading afterglow, colors seep, 
nonsensical or naughty studio clutter, quirky, raw personality, rather than critical ideas or ideals, has unapologetically taken center stage. Erratic, inner turmoil, seemingly sudden inner impulse to paint, all are overworked. Within all the clutter of materials and gestures resides a very specific historical mark, Jackson Pollock's no notorious drip. She destroys form, color everywhere, pouring, spraying, bleaching, nailing, screwing, sewing, stringing, linking, collaging, reusing, repurposing, and reworking images, textiles, fabrics, and paper. All clash together in what first seems like a naive push to expand the possibilities of abstraction. Nothing in either show feels as permanent, profound, and timeless as iconic art from historic patriarchies. Um, none of that is anything that I wrote. It's all taken. And it gave me a very clear idea of the ways in which my body was already in the work all the time. And that body was the body of a white female. And that body is very... Uh, materially inseparable <laughs> from the materiality of the painting um, for a certain kind of viewer. And I don't know if that certain kind of viewer is still all of the viewers who are looking and talking and reading and, and making, making language about painting today, but that was really telling to me and still informs what I try to do. Um, okay, one more thing. In the frequently cited Judith Butler idea of performativity, gestures and speech acts do not express an interior identity. They perform that very identity and even its assumed quality of interiority. In this way, performativity reverses the idea that an identity is the source of more secondary actions, speech and gestures. Instead, it inquires into the construction of identities as they are caused by performative actions, behaviors, and gestures. So that's what we see in that, in that text. However, these acts are not performed by lone individuals. Rather, the production of cultural signification for bodies, e.g. gender, relies upon and is enforced by discursive power, and so they are always already situated within larger social contexts. This is a zine I did um, in about, I don't know, oh, of course, uh, 2000 or 1999, uh, before 9-11, everything in the world is before and after. Um, so this effort that I've been making um, to deliberately lack in design I, apparently goes all the way back to when I was about 25 years old um, and maybe before I won't say anything more about that zine. This is a book that Corbett versus Dempsey published for me on the occasion of Violet Fogg's Azure Snot, which was the title of a show um, that I had in their gallery. Um, and it was one of the possible translations of a line from Rambeau, the poet, the French poet. And so because I was thinking about, okay, I'm gonna use this translation so I can use this word snot, because I wanted to use the word snot. Um, then I thought, oh, my name then becomes possible to translate. So everybody that worked at the gallery um, and I, we sat around and brainstormed. This was not generated by any algorithm. We just sat around and made ideas about what Molly Zuckerman Hartung sounds like. Sounds like Mommy Zuckerman Sandfun. Sounds like, oh, Violent Fags, Azure, Asher, Asher Flem, um, Mally Thunderbird Hordum. Moldy Suckerbird shut in. It was like it was like how can I sort of like lose my name, translate my name, and let it just just go. Um, okay, maybe I'll show you more images of that show a little later. But this is a painting from the next show at Corbett versus Dempsey four years later or so, which um, was called just Jennifer Jason Lee. It took on a whole new name, Jennifer Jason Lee. Um, resembles me because she's also a white girl who has brown hair. Um, and basically every other white girl with brown hair that I've ever seen, I'm like, oh, we're like, we're like each other, right? And, and when you see me from the back, maybe you think, oh, you're that white girl with brown hair. It's a very, um, one time I saw, actually, <laughs> true story, I saw this white girl with brown hair trying to unhitch a trailer from 
their truck because their trailer was on fire on the side of the road. And I started panicking and panicking. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like totally freaking out because I, on some level, thought it was me. And my wife, Fox, was like, it's not even a woman, Molly. <laughs> I was like this rocker dude. <laughs> Um, but the, the sort of uncanny experience of, oh, that's me, and I'm actually like scared for me right now over there. Um, I mean, I was also scared for then him, but that's a different feeling. Uh, anyway, so this is one of the paintings in that show. It's called something, Jennifer Jason Lee. All of the paintings in the show are, but I can't remember what. Um, but I wanted to show you the process of this painting because it's one of the things that I like to share. So the version on the left I made in Shelton, Connecticut in 2016, the day after Trump was elected. And I feel like there was a point where everybody always was sharing what painting they made after Trump was elected. It was sort of like, what did you do? <laughs> oh, I made a painting, of course, you know. What, what, what was that painting? Because, like, you know, everything had changed. Um, so yeah, so then on the, on the right is the second phase, um, which involves also this I started talking to my classes and we were talking about how, to, how do we talk about this and think about this. It's also got um, rats at the bottom to try to designate the bottom. And then on the right, there's a timeline. It's like one of those children's books timelines that goes back to like the Mesozoic or the Paleozoic or whatever, like way, way, way back. And I was like looking at this timeline and thinking about history and time and how fucking long it was and how with global warming and the kind of like acceleration of climate crisis that we were going to experience during the Trump years, um, that timeline was getting like truncated. I mean, it was truncated already, but just feeling that, I got so dizzy I had to lie down. And the experience of having to lie down because I was that dizzy about an idea or a set of ideas um, is part of what's built into this painting and part of why I like to show its process. So another step and another step. It's, it's hit, hideous. I mean, I think it's hideous. It's, so, you know, the whole time I'm just like, how do I make this less hideous? Um, I think most painters have a more sophisticated process, but often mine is just, <laughs> how do I make this less hideous? Um, this is this little, is this where my ironic moment takes place? <laughs> I was thinking a lot about Richard Rorty's idea of the ironic moment. Um, that parrot, actually, at the top was painted by my grandmother. It's one of those like 1950s paint-by-number things. I think it was only there for a while and then came out. At some point, I, I strung a grid onto it and started filling in the grid um, and working with that. Made these kind of channels. It's got a lot of like channel pores, which is something I was doing a lot of at the time, which you can see in like the, the queer painting, queer history painting in the show. Um, at some point, it became about big data. <laughs> It's like, you know, I'm reading the newspaper, I'm thinking about these ideas. I'm not like trying to make them conceptual. They're just getting kind of built in. The thinking process is just um, sedimenting. Uh, and so at some point during that gridded period, I started making a pencil drawing of it, which is something I do when I feel totally exasperated by a painting. But I don't often make paintings this way. Um, this is the, one of the kind of the standard sizes that I use, which is the size of a double bed. Um, I suppose everything is different now because I'm married and my partner wife, Fox, refuses to sleep in any bed smaller than a queen. She really would prefer a king. Um, but I don't know about a queen-size painting, let alone a king-size painting, like on a regular basis, right? But the double bed no longer matters. And the whole thing about the double bed was like it's me in there, I'm reading books. The books are all stacked up on the other side. I'm single, I've been single for most of my life. And so it was totally about like the horizontality of life. Like it was about all that time spent in bed. And then there's this painting that sort of reflects that exact scale in this vertical space. Um, and so that doesn't really pertain anymore. Oh, it's a queen size bed and I only get half and I don't get to have books in it and everything is different. <laughs> <laughs> I love being married, though, but it has changed everything. Um, Hannah Arendt, in The Life of the Mind, um, describes the non-appearance of thought. Thinking doesn't look like anything, she wrote, in some more eloquent way. And I think again about the wigs I would wear, the pantomimes and dances and lip-sync performances, and agitated pimple-picking sessions, and the thousands of cigarettes I self-consciously smoked, all in ostensible privacy in my bedrooms and studios while trying to think, write, and paint over the past 25 years. 
The many paintings I made of Susan Sontag, who mastered the art of appearing to think while or perhaps before and after thinking, and whose death became the occasion for many critics to discuss her appearance endlessly and for an onslaught of photographs of her striking poses, often in front of books. Her traveling companion was the photographer Annie Leibovitz, and Sontag wrote a book about photography in which she called for an ecology of images. To be alive means to be possessed by an urge to self-display, which answers the fact of one's own appearingness. By Hannah Arendt, two more quotes by her, it seems only natural that thinking will discriminate against appearances and perception will discriminate against thought. Um, this is like the entire presupposition in, in, involved with conceptual art. And part of the reason that I emphasize this a lot, because I think it's, it's true that, I think I said it in somebody's studio today, that, that looking is not exactly synchronous with thinking. Uh, there's a kind of conflict there. Whatever can see wants to be seen. Whatever can hear calls out to be heard. Whatever can touch presents itself to be touched. So um, just to prove my point about Susan Sontag, this is the shelf at um, Atticus Bookstore in New Haven, uh, one of the bookstores that I go to on a regular basis. And you can see the Susan Sontag there, right? Three shelves up, right in the middle from the bottom. Um, it's the only book that doesn't have any words on the cover. It just has her iconic image. That's all that was needed for her biography was just a photograph of Susan Sontag. Um, every other book on there has words, but not Susan Sontag's book. Uh, this is a classroom of mine at Northwestern University about 12 years ago or something called Reading Moby Dick. Reading Moby Dick as artists. Um, so we read Moby Dick as artists. And we went all around the campus and read Moby Dick to each other out loud and talked about it and made critical drawings and paintings about it and thought about it. And I don't know. It's a, it's a rich book. So here's Lionel Trilling's idea again. <laughs> it's the kind of idea you have to say twice. All right, I think I'm just gonna show you some pictures for a while. This is a tiny little eight by 10 in my studio right now. It's got holes in it, so when you hang it in front of the window, the light twinkles through. Um, we're gonna get to the curves. Maybe I'm hitting the curves already, but the curves are, I am hitting the curves already. The curves partly come out of this basic rule about drawing um, the human body, which is that the curve is on one side of the leg and the straight line is on the other side of the leg, and then in the next part of the leg, the curve is on the other side and the straight line is on the other side. This is like a rule, like if you look at those sort of like, you know, like 1950s how to draw books, they'll show you like how to draw the body and these like curves and straight lines are kind of like alternating rhythms on the body. And, for a couple of years, I just drew that constantly, just trying to think about it. Um, I don't know what I ended up thinking about it, but one of the things is that I allowed myself to really move from straight lines to curves in a very conscien conscious way, conscientious way. Um, so this is Dick, Dick Box in a different form. Dick Box is in the show. Um, possible names for curves. There it is again, the curve in the straight, the straight in the curve. I, drew, I draw a lot of like, I don't know, knots and things as well. Many people do. Um, it's a tiny little eight by 10 painting. And I just realized it's got chewing gum in it and these kind of channel pores again, I sort of make a structure and then pour the paint into it, but it keeps it kind of within boundaries. Um, this is a much larger painting. This is a double bed size painting, maybe slightly squarer than that, um, called Gutters. Um, and I just sort of realized their morphological similarity the other day and put them together. Um, this paper, this painting is uh, full of bleach and so it's falling apart. You can sort of see in that middle window, the, there's a lot of like velvet silk, um, velvet that's actually made from silk and it's really fragile and I just like drenched it in bleach and so it's, it doesn't really have any life left. Um, but it, there it is. It's actually, it's sold and I, was really like, tell the buyers. <laughs> it's really falling apart. No, really this time. Um, this is just a, a studio drawing when I was working in Shelton, Connecticut. I was working with these curves all the time. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see that kind of wee uh, root, what is it? Uh, vine, that vine form. Um, that's, uh, it's called Oriental Bittersweet. And it's a, a vine that is 
um, invasive in the New England area, and you find it everywhere. And in the winter time, it's it's these lovely curving shapes that are often, you know, strangling trees and and other foliage. Um, so curve experiments, and part of what interested me about these curves was that they could also be kind of like like they could set up time structures. So they were this kind of very material, very like clear, like it's a line that curves. Okay, what does it do? But then also it can set up, it can like this, like it can feel like a clock or like something that I can photograph and show in, in repetition. Um, and so you can sort of see time changing. Um, I've maybe already given you too many ideas, um, or, you know, whatever, but, um, but yeah, something I'm thinking about constantly is just uh, not directed thinking. Um, so there's a way in which I just don't want to be in charge of the practice. I'm really interested in what ideas turn up and how I repeat ideas and what I come back to. But in the end, it's non-purposiveness <laughs> in, a, in a very large way. Um, and I, I just it was interesting finding out the medieval mind contrived absurd questions um, like how many angels can balance on the head of a pin. Maybe you've heard that question before. And I never really understood, like, what... Why, why was the medieval monk thinking about such a, a thing? Um, and apparently it was actually to produce non-purposive or non-directed thought, which is a particular kind of thought. Um, okay, some paintings in the show. Um, I think I just, there's so many things to say about everything, but I didn't want to say much here. I just wanted to show um, the cut and the exchange in these two paintings, and to say that these paintings precede um, my acquisition of a sewing machine. <laughs> they were made in, in Chicago before I bought my sewing machine. And so I was still working on how do I get seams, how do I get difference, how do I put parts together into a larger whole, the whole relationship of part to whole. Um, these are some doors that I just drew very recently, um, and I'm just partially open. Partially open door is a sort of new idea for me. No need to transgress when you have a partially open door, but I also think about them in terms of the unconscious. It's a little painting that came out of working on the partially open door. This painting is it's called Going Into Space, and I always think about it as like, you know, hasn't quite gone into space yet, like this funny little figure is sort of like winking at you and saying like, I'm gonna go really soon, <laughs> but I haven't gone yet. Um, I'm still on the front of this painting. I haven't gone inside yet. There's young men in Matt during the installation of the show in front of the 95 Theses and the Chris Rock Oscars. So now we're in the sewn paintings and I just wanted to sort of show a bunch of gridded sewn paintings. Um, there it is, the sewing machine. And you can see out the window, um, one of the many, uh, this was when I lived in Shelton, Connecticut, one of the many like rubble piles out the window. So I was thinking all the time about like, every time I look out the window, what I'm looking at is um, a ruin of some kind. I'm looking at like rubble, I'm looking at uh, a kind of catastrophe. Um, this was a, a brown, what's that called, brown site? I always forget what it's called. It's the, it was a horribly chemical, um, disaster site, basically across from this warehouse that we were living in. Um, there's the sewing machine in a different light. This idea of two fingers keeping her place in the book has always been important to me. The very old painting that I always just talk about in terms kind of like holding your place in the book that this painting grasps, it can hold. So that image in there of the, it's Matisse's piano lesson, the colors are based on Matisse's piano lesson and there's a little image of the piano lesson in there and it's being held by the kind of like rough burlap surface and the kind of like cheap fruit bag from the grocery store with some socks inside of it. And between those two, there's enough friction that it's, the painting is holding. Um, and I'm going to have to start really dashing through, but I just wanted to, because I'm totally running out of time, um, but I wanted to actually just share this list, because I'm thinking of this very much as a kind of educational. So here we go. This painting has a pocket. That's how it holds. 
Um, okay, things that paintings do. They hold or grasp things. Paintings were once compared to windows. Paintings frame. Paintings have real space, which is built in time. The further back came first. The closest to the viewer is last. Paintings reflect, in other words, that time traveler, that, that going into space painting, that figure is a time traveler. They're going to go back in time, right? Um, I think that's super interesting. Paintings reflect our verticality and the implicit hierarchy of standing up. Paintings often contain horizontal experiences, pores, stretching, gesso, if not the whole process. Paintings have illusionistic space because they are flat, but illusion is a problem. Paintings are supposed to be flat because that is what makes them specific and that is what makes them, being specific, um, medium specificity is what makes paintings a vehicle for embodied thought. Um, that's the most important point there. That's the reason that, despite the fact that I think sculpture would be way better, more suited for me, I'm committed to painting because I'm committed to this kind of one idea, embodied thought. Um, I've become very committed to certain repetitions. These are some book sculptures I've made. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't be a good sculpture, a sculptor. <laughs> I wouldn't be a good sculpture either. I move too much. <laughs> um, there's a, this is silk and then I, I didn't like it, and so I took it apart, took it outside. Um, these are those same windows, and this is, it's kind of for scale, this photo, because this painting is one of the, what I call dirty windows paintings, and I made a bunch of them, and I was always scaling them after some window that I was, you know, emotionally attached to in some way. Um, and the idea for me about the dirty window was like, what I'm seeing out the window is really hard to look at, and I really prefer the window to be dirty enough um, so that I don't have to look at it. It was a kind of like, um, like I seem to want to close my eyes. And I was just reading like amazing interview with uh, Carolee Schneemann by Maggie Nelson. And Carolee Schneemann, like, like she shows like an image of her dead cat to, to an audience. And she's like, I see you looking away. I can't look away. Um, in this really profound way. She's just saying, like, I have to look. And I've, I've been way more of a wimp than Carolee Schneemann. I'm working on changing that. So there it is, dirty window again with the bead, bead game, bead maze. Another dirty window. These are, you know, they're, st they're stitched first and then the, the paint happens on top of um, them and then there's bleach and dye and bleach and dye and also paint. Um, and it happens on, sometimes on both sides. There's two of the dirty windows in the show. This may be the most like actual patchwork painting I've ever made and it's, um, it's got some patchworks that I actually bought on the internet that are um, what's called uh, crazy quilts. And I won't go on about that, but at some point I was really researching the history of what's called the crazy quilt. And it's actually crazed, the word is crazed that it's coming from, not like insanity crazy, um, which came out of the glazes in the Japanese booth in Philadelphia in like, what, 18 something. At the World's Fair, there was a Japanese booth and there were a lot of glazed ceramics and the glazed ceramics had like crackle glaze. And people were totally into this and it started up a crazy phase. Um, of quilting to make it look like the crackle of the glaze. That painting is also about the clinic, <laughs> the, um, the Gross Clinic, the Aikens painting, which was painted right around the same time as that World's Fair in Philadelphia, but I'm not gonna go on and on about that. Um, here's an installation that I made for a show in Georgia years ago in Augusta, Georgia, the show was about schizophrenia. I was asked to participate and then give a talk. And so I did a lot of research about schizophrenia and the history of it, and also made this installation. This is me showing it at a different talk at Evergreen. Um, there's a, a video on display in the exhibition, and this is a kind of like working image from the making of that video from an Airbnb in New Haven when I was just beginning to teach at Yale. And, taking the, driving up to, to New Haven and staying in an Airbnb. And so those are pieces of construction paper on the wall. You can almost maybe see me in that convex mirror hung on the wall. Um, I'm sort of making a Velasquez joke. Um, yeah, and then this, this is uh, Chantal Ackerman 
in um, Je Tui Lel. So a lot of that, that movie that I made, that video that I made, was sort of me watching Je Tui Lel, another um, white woman with brown hair. She eats a bag of sugar in that video, that film. If you haven't seen it, it's so freaking good. Um, it's a seminal lesbian film, I would say. It's fun to put the word seminal with lesbian. <laughs> uh, it's my mom wearing one of those masks in that um, Chris Rock Oscars painting. Um, she was helping me cut them out. And the whole video was projected onto this canvas, um, like multiple colored canvases and pieces of paper and things, grid on the wall. So it was sort of like really working with the grid, basically. I'm just trying to show you about my work with the grid. This painting is called Melanie Klein's Part Object. That would be the breast, the rep representations of the breast. Um, oh my god, I'm so out of time. OK. Just going to fly through grids. So there's a lot of like thinking about the grid as a linear st structure for linear time, sort of recording time, or making kind of like calendars. Um, this one you can see like I, I bleached the, the letters on the back. So, and then this is the front. And so trying to get you to even think about the back. These paintings are all from about 2016. I showed them at, at Lyles, and, Lyles and King Gallery in New York. Um, in a show called Queen. <laughs> that was a Dana DiGiulio and my bad joke. Good joke. Why do I call it a bad joke? This is also, this painting is also from the Jennifer Jason Lee show at Corbett versus Dempsey. This painting on the far left is mine and it was shown very recently at an art fair. Um, it's called Lips Like a Bedroom Hung Entirely in Black. Still excited about that title. But you can see the seams. So there's these like certain ways of using the seam and developing a rhythm with those seams is one of the main projects. Um, this is from Learning Artist, an installation of Learning Artist at Rachel Efner. Oops. So I've, my whole goal with this talk was to just show you some of the things in the show over at the Blaffer, but in different contexts, in different uses, in different ways. Um, this is a little stage that I made um, in one of the very first Zoom classes that I taught when we went into COVID. I started making these little stages kind of like while I was teaching as a way to sort of like, I don't know, like act like I was still in a room with other people, like to sort of think about a miniature room. Um, you know, my students would, we would talk and, you know, have critiques and everything else. But sometimes we would just work together and just sort of be companionable in silence. And then I would do something like that. Um, these folded pieces are also something I've been working on a lot. And I, I, I really like to think of them as pulling together the space and the time that I think I've been talking about in different ways. Um, that they have a certain amount of depth, like actual physical depth. And the threads um, are what holds them together. So it's just paper and various other spray paint and things, um, and then string that kind of pulls together the, the accordion or pushes it apart. And the way that I stitch the figures into it produces a kind of tension with the ground. This is a six and a half foot tall painting, again with the, now the bands being um, stacked. So these are recent, these are from the last couple of years. There's me and Tyler talking about the book in one of the many Zoom sessions. We were trying to figure out where things go. <laughs> um, this is at that talk that I gave at the Evergreen State College. So, you know, this is one way to see one of my paintings. This is a photo of a photo of the no. This is that wall in the show. Um, where is it? Do you see which one I was pointing out? Is it? Oh, there's a drawing in the middle center towards the bottom that's in the show. Oh, and then of course the one with the green kind of plastic over it. And you can see on the middle right over here, there it is in the studio at some moment um, 10, 15 years ago. This is comic relief when it got bagged up. I thought it was extra funny. 
I'm sure that wasn't an art handler there much more. That was me. <laughs> there we go. There it is. Um, oh yeah, I want to talk about the zip, this, um, this line down the center of a painting. So these are two paintings that I hinged together at some point seven or eight years ago, and then um, this is where that, those paintings ended up, is I cut the middle stripe out of the left-hand painting and flipped it and sewed it back in. Um, So the front is the back and the back is the front. They're both connected to each other. Um, but so just working on this, like again and again, this kind of spine structure, and I just wanted to give a nod to Barnett Newman. When I was in graduate school, I was really obsessed with Barnett Newman. Um, I don't know if I could even tell you why now. I was just like, this is super interesting. It was like, he was like a philosopher. Like he wasn't even really a painter. He was just coming like, th and so many abstract painters, I think that that's how they sort of approached painting was from the perspective of, of philosophy. And I've studied philosophy in, in undergrad and was far more sort of, gr I understood theory and philosophy and ideas, maybe, maybe not well, but better than I understood what painting was. Um, and so there was this way in which I was really sort of interested in how that had happened and how, like, what is an idea when it's embodied in materiality and hangs on the wall and, you know, um, but that zip, boy, was that zip important to me. Um, and that, People often talked about it in like art history classes as being like like the like the poles in the subway, which was also very interesting to me, right? It's like it's like something you hold on to when the thing is moving, right? So there's this idea that the painting makes you kind of dizzy and you need something to hold on to, something to center you, something to ground you. And I was just still am very compelled by that. Um, it also sets up rhythms. I mean, these are really obvious things about paintings, but I think that they're sort of bare worth repeating. Um, economic comic from 2014 or something. Hilariously, I made this and then Corbett and Dempsey were like, oh, we want to take that to the art fair. And then they like sold it at the art fair right away. And I was like, that's so funny. That's like what this painting wanted to do is just go be an economic comic. <laughs> wanted to go be funny, funny for money. Most of my paintings don't necessarily do that, especially not these days. Um, okay, Betty Boop. I'm gonna tell you a lot about Betty Boop and then I think I'm gonna have to just fly and then be out of time. But I wanna tell you a lot about Betty Boop. Baby Esther Jones, a black Chicago woman and well-known singer of the 1920s, is the initial inspiration for the cartoon character Betty Boop, who first appeared in the 1930s. Helen Kane, a white singer, attempted to sue the, Fleischer, the Max Fleischer studio, which created the Betty Boop cartoon, and her claim was that they stole her signature Boop Boop a Doop style. The judge decided that the proof of this was insufficient, thus dismissing the case. This was all after baby Esther Jones, the actual inspiration for Betty Boop, the actual innovator of the whole sort of routine of Betty Boop was dead. Okay, boop boop a doop is a scat line. In vocal jazz, scat singing is vocal improvisation with wordless vocables, nonsense syllables, or without words at all. In scat singing, the singer improvises melodies and rhythms using the voice as an instrument rather than a speaking medium. I bought the fuzzy petroleum blanket, fuzzy petroleum product boop blanket from its display next to a Star Wars blanket in a dollar store in Ukrainian village in 2014, and I made the painting as a way of researching and thinking about the whitewashing of the figure. Formally, the breaks or interruptions of the image of boop, not incidentally also the first female cartoon, operate as a slowing of the process of seeing. In the image, boop, it spell-checked me, damn it, book, that's funny though, right, is winking. I drew attention to her inability to look back by slicing through the single open eye. I paired Betty on the left with a rhythmic patchwork on the right, also inspired by African-American creations, G's Bend quilts. I displaced the legs of the image to portray them not as performing a classic new gesture, but rather to look as if she were running, escaping her capture as a whitewashed icon. Then I unstretched and rolled the painting up for five years, unsure about my right to display this work. The movement from horizontal blanket to vertical painting matters. I pulled it out for this exhibition, which is heavily discursive and oriented as pedagogy for the University of Houston art students with long texts written by the curator Tyler Blackwell next to many paintings. This was Tyler's, Tyler's pullout 
I'm giving you credit. <laughs> um, so there, there it is again. I'm hoping it sparks and sustains conversation about ideas of femininity, blackness, whiteness, jazz improvisation, textile histories, color field painting, gesture, both as a frozen pose and as a performative material intervention, and American histories. My interest in boop is multivalent. I have a tattoo on my arm designed by a Japanese erotic dancer, Miss Erochika Bamboo, with whom I was on the Sex Workers Art Show tour in 2003 another collective. I was the roadie for that tour, and at some point we all got tattoos designed by Chica, who was dancing on the tour. The Sex Workers Art Show was a traveling cabaret conceived and organized by Annie Oakley, that was her stage name, in, her early, in the early 2000s and performed in by many sex workers and performers in all kinds of venues, including strip clubs and college campuses. The show was sexy, funny, brilliant, and educational, generating awareness of the labor issues surrounding the field of sex work, from phone sex operators, porn stars, whores, pole dancers, and performance artists, such as Annie Sprinkle. My tattoo strongly resembles the boob character, but from a Japanese perspective, which pulls in the history of tattooing during World War II in Japan. The sex appeal of this tattoo for some men was immediately apparent to me and somehow surprising. Some men seem to take it as an invitation to openly sexualize me because I have this tattoo. As a queer woman, do I identify with this image or do I desire it? When I make a painting with a figure of some kind in it, does the viewer identify me, the maker, with the figure? How does the history of men painting representations of horizontal women complicate this understanding of identification? What does my commitment to horizontality in painting, the floor, the ground, have to do with the history of representation? And my choice to identify as an abstract painter? So there it is again in the Shelton studio. Um, against the light. Um, this is a, an earlier version of the, what I called power pour for a long time, um, history painting for the new queer subject. And there it is, finished. And this painting, I don't have time, so I'm not going to go into it, but it contains a lot of Cezanne's bathers kind of underneath and inside of it, and Cezanne's bathers. The reason that I decided this painting was a history painting for the new queer subject is because I wanted uh, queerness to really own Cezanne. Like, n plenty of painters in history were maybe gay, um, but I think Cezanne was, was really queer <laughs> um, in, his, in his vision and in his ways of making bodies and how he understood bodies to be strangely morphing into one another and strangely sexed strangely and um, you know butts become shoulders and things are, things are very odd in the bodies in the bathers and I find that very exciting. There's a wonderful essay about it by T.J. Clark that I always make students read um, but I sort of just wanted to, I wanted to pull Cezanne on in and say these are, these are queer paintings. Um, this is a, maybe the, f I think it's the oldest work of art in the show and I really, I really pushed it on the show and then Tyler was like, yes, yes, we're gonna put it right next to the, to the Notley painting in the, in the entrance. Um, it's, it's a self-portrait, a, a nude self-portrait um, made from a pinhole f photo, it's a, it's a pinhole photo, um, pinhole camera and then contact printed. So it's the size, the negative was made out of paper, photo paper and then the, photo is made out of the same photo paper in the same size. It's just contact printed, no enlargement. Um, and you can see me way, way, way back there. It might be kind of hard to see me. Um, but this was made in like the very first art class I took, which was a black and white photography class. And I had maybe learned about Francesca Woodman. I don't know, but I clearly grasped something about Francesca Woodman. Um, and about like, again, it's a figure ground relationship. And I was obviously not placing myself in the figure position, I was kind of obscuring. Um, so here is, uh, yeah, making making the no painting, the Notley painting. There it is. It's it's hinged, so it can sit in the corner, which I always loved to perform, the cornered quality, which is also, of course, like a book. There it is in the Whitney Biennial, with Amy Silman and um, Sterling Ruby's. Uh, ashtrays, dog dishes. There it is again. Lurch. 
Okay, I'm just going to fly through these and take about two, two more minutes as I do it, and then you should be gathering your questions. So I'm going to stop. That's me and my painting and Rauschenberg and his painting. This painting is called Hedda Gobbler, after the Ibsen Caliph. This is that show, Violet Fogg's Azure Snot at um, Corbett versus Dempsey. There's the other wall in that show. There's the show. That's me and Fox back there. And that brilliant door, genius idea of Tyler's. Um, okay, that's my dad. Um, the first time I made a blanket, the first time I turned the textiles into a blanket and not trying to make it a painting, was um, to send one of these, to, to send something to um, my Aunt Marilyn, who was dying of cancer, and, um, and then she died of cancer. <laughs> and then my uncle died of cancer, and then my dad got cancer, and then I sent a blanket to my dad, and here he is, and my dad is still alive, thank goodness. Um, that there was this, I made these at Rauschenberg, and the death prints were all about, like, my aunt and my uncle both died. My aunt got a, a rare form of brain cancer called glioblastoma and lost language for six months before she finally drank the, the poison to die. They live in Washington State where you can, it's right to die, and so thank goodness she could have a death with dignity. But um, anyway, I was really thinking about death. Um, and just trying to like think about it as death. <laughs> like, uh, don't think any deeper, just death. Um, okay, I'm, I'm gonna call it, call it good there. I feel like there's so many more. <laughs> so, time for questions. <laughs> here, here. I would love to hear questions, but I'm just gonna like scroll through, but please don't, don't. Yeah. I'm finished. <laughs> Especially because there's a, a big exhibition over there. I thought I had the chance to really say a lot of words, but I don't know. Questions? Yeah? OK. Yeah. Hmm, that's such a good question. I don't think anything is natural. <laughs> or like, I don't know what natural means. Um, I think it's, for me, I would just say it's a super intentional kind of a challenge. And I don't always, like, sometimes I'm like, what am, it doesn't mean anything. I don't know what I'm talking, you know, it's like, it's not always a meaningful category to me. It's, it, when I started making paintings, it, when I was in grad school, it was 2003 to 2007, and it's, I mean, shit's cr changed so fast, you know, like the conversations are totally different, the internet has made discourse and debate and dispute and, you know, all kinds of things just totally different, but like, you know, G's Bend quilts weren't yet seen as important or valid, like, I mean, they had, they were still disputed, right? There was like, fibers were still seen as like women's work. There were so many things that hadn't, sort of been like like proved I guess in the way that that now so I was just constantly arguing basically and I was just like well this matters and this matters and damn it I have to be a painter you have to take this seriously and people were like you're hysterical and I was like well that's important too let's talk about hysteria you know it was like that's so I don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes Right, 
That's beautiful. Will you write that down? <laughs> I really want you to do that for me. I really want to like buy you three martinis and be like, okay, tell me why. Um, because I really don't, I mean, it's actually really funny. I've been trying to defend the term lesbian as if it needs to be defended these days. But my wife is really like, get over it. Like, just like, it's, it's, it's exclusion. People feel excluded by it, so stop using it. Like say LGBTQ, blah, blah, blah. Or say queer, like stop saying. And I'm like, no, 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 like, you know, give me something to argue with. And I'll start saying like, no, I'm a lesbian. And she's like, you're not even a lesbian, you're bisexual. You know, I don't know. Anyway, my point is labels are, apparently have like a kind of like a thing about like overclaiming and then like moving on or, I don't know, I, uh, I don't know why that is. But I think um, to answer your question really clearly, I actually think Tyler found the representational artist in me in that because that show like blows my mind I'm like this is like a pop show like it's so kind of full of kind of pop gestures um, and it's so much about appropriation which you're right is like it's so much about like here's a gesture I'm gonna borrow it and re repeat it here's a gesture I'm gonna borrow it and repeat it here's a quote like here's another quote like it's totally taken what is that Lawrence Wiener that amazing Lawrence Wiener text it's like taken from somewhere and placed somewhere else like I, I um, I made a painting in graduate school that's, that was like a giant text painting that said, what does it matter who is speaking? Someone said, what does it matter who is speaking? Um, it's, it was a quote, it's like Foucault quoted Roland Barthes, who quoted Beckett or something like that. It's like a triple quote. And then I used Christopher Wool's approach to making paintings to, to do it. And my, I think that's still what I'm asking. What does it matter who is speaking? You know, is, is, it, is it different when Bruce Nauman does his contraposto or when I do contraposto, right? Of course it's different, you know? It's, all, it's just like it matters who is speaking. But that sentence, what does it matter who is speaking, someone said, what does it matter who is speaking, comes out of the death of the author arguments, um, which I was really interested in debating with and, and wanting to, it's like I want to keep those arguments alive, death of painting, death of the author, those deaths I think are really meaningful. Same as I think Clement Greenberg's arguments about medium specificity and flatness are really meaningful. And to try to keep the argument alive is always my goal. You know, it's like there's been a debate in history and these things don't like die off. They, they're, they're still meaningful. It's not like somebody won, right? I mean, somebody won, but Somebody else will win next time because <laughs> the debates will continue because they actually contain really meaningful arguments. And so I guess maybe what I'm trying to do is just like keep, keep conflict alive in a really deep way. <laughs> I don't like surface conflict much. I like like, let's get into it. That's my long answer. Thank you for saying that though. I totally appreciate strong opinions like that. <laughs> yes. Will you speak up? I'm sorry. Oh, huh, that's beautiful. I think that's a genius. Thanks. You guys are totally helping me think. That's great. You're right. It's totally, I mean, it's like Joni Mitchell, right? Like I used to always play both sides now and I would start a talk like, it's totally silly, but it's like, yeah, like, if you walk a mile in another man's shoes is another cliche, right? Like, yeah, but like seeing the other, seeing another side, like let's, can I see another side, you know? And at the same time, like what's beautiful about trying to see another side is you actually need other people, you know? Like we're, that's why we only have eyes in the front of our head in my opinion, you know? Like we need other people to watch our backs. We need other people to like all the time to show us a different side of something. And so there is something for me about that like sidedness. I think it's like, it's, it's emotionally important. I don't know, the way that paintings hold their backs to the wall, like it's like they're both paranoid, but also like, I don't know, they're social in a certain way. I don't know. I, I think what you just said is great, thank you. <laughs> yes? You gonna yell? Problem of time. The 
problem of time. <laughs> I mean, death. <laughs> death is the problem of time. Um, the, big, the big problem, right? Um, it's limited, um, which I guess, I mean, it's always limited, though. It's like, you know, I don't have enough time because I have to get to the, I get to work, you know, I have to, like, I'm running out of time, so I ran that red light. Like, I don't know, like, time is, time is, um, God, my stepdad always said time is money, which made me really mad. Um, but, I, you know, nothing he said did I agree with, but... What is the problem of time in painting? I think just that, that, that strange thing that like you start with the first layer and you build onto it like very materially to make a painting. What happens first on the painting in linear time is also what is furthest away. And that's a, that's a mental flip actually, right? Because you think like, okay, I'll deal with first things first, what's in front of me, right? But in fact, in a painting, you have to think about last things first and then build up from it. And I still don't know if I know how to do that, but I think that that takes an immense amount of perspective and maturity and slowness and methodicalness and, and all of these things that I haven't had, as one can clearly tell. Um, but, I, but I'm interested in that, right? Like, I think that that's really meaningful. And yeah, problem of time. I mean, there was, I'll just say one more thing, which is the, because the, I, I love to quote people, Dan Gustin, who taught at the Art Institute, would always like walk a group of students through the, the Art Institute and say, what's in the front, what's in the back? What's in the front, what's in the back? You get to another painting, you'd be like, what's in the front, what's in the back? And this is like a really, he's like one of those painters, like, you know, goes to Italy every summer and paints in some Italian school or whatever. <laughs> he went to Yale, blah, blah, blah. He's like an older man with very red face. I don't know, you know, it's like the, that's what the painters say. What's in the front, what's in the back, you know? Somehow that's like the problem of time. Yes? Um, I wanted to ask about the relationship between two different aspects of your work. Um, one is the, uh, the common um, quality of your work, and I can sort of see, I think about, um, on the one hand, Martin Kinsberger and Elizabeth Murray at another end of the spectrum. And, and so there's clearly that one is, you know, where is that comedy coming from? But I wonder if you could talk about how does that have any relationship to the way you treat surfaces? Because I notice in your work, there's, you, you never leave the surface of the painting undisturbed. Um, there, there are cuts and holes and um, things attached to it. And, and is there some you feel or see or think about the relationship between the common status of the work or common attitude of the work and how you treat surfaces? Yeah, thanks for asking that. I used to, here, I'll come back to this microphone. I used to always talk about things like that, and, and now I never know what to talk about. Like, the older you get, the more you're like, I don't know, where do I start? <laughs> but um, in graduate school, there were bit major leaks in my studio. Um, and this is the first time I even had a studio, right? Before that, I was painting in the bedroom. Major leaks, and so they would put, like, giant, dump, the, the janitors would come in and put giant um, trash cans in my studio. And one night, and so I, you know, I had to move around the leaks, and I've had many studios with that problem since. And then one night, um, I had made a painting, and I had left it flat to dry. It had a big channel. I was making these channel paintings all the way back in graduate school. Um, and the janitors came in, in in the middle of the night and tipped it up on one end. And so the, there was a slow pour. Like, I wanted it to kind of be like a marsh. <laughs> um, but they tipped it up and made it go whoosh. And they, they, thankfully, like, they chose the vertical position so that the channel could go, but it was, um, totally changed it. And then, and so I always give them credit, because I think that was a much better painting. Um, but you see, like, and, and there's been many more since. There's been, like, entire gallons of orange paint, like, tipped onto the floor that then, like, happened, there was a painting, like, that it's lying in it, and what a beautiful spill. Like, it's actually a spill, though. I think there was something about that, that kind of, I am clumsy, and I have a, 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 I'm not a very, I don't touch things very grace, gracefully, you know? I mean, and then weirdly, like, I think my touch often looks kind of like Frenchy or something. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, I'm just, like, I'm stuck with the touch that I'm stuck with. Like, it, 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 
there's a comedic quality to it that I've never been able to get rid of. And at some point, I really started embracing it and thinking like, all right, that's my that's my touch, that's my moves. Like people would always like say like, oh, you're always like moving around or you know, it's yeah, it, it is the way the material gets onto the material. Oh, and also like, you know, making a bunch of small paintings and leaning them on against the, the studio wall and then making more paintings above them. So of course those paintings are all dripping onto those paintings underneath. Like just, I can't even, the number of strategies that I had that were terrible that produced more incidents and accidents, hints and allegations. <laughs> yes. I mean, clearly it does, because I like, d like take every talk as an opportunity to show people what a mess, you know? <laughs> I mean, I, w I don't know if I would actually say like, yes, that irritates me, except for like, I display that that irritates me constantly. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's just like, it's like messiness is inherently considered less than or bad or I can tell you that I haven't been as messy in the last few years. Like we bought this house, like I'm more, like I'm just more of an adult than ever. I mean, I finally quit my job because I was like, I'm like, I've lost all of my like sloppy, messy, funny, fucked upness. Like I want it back. Like I want to make the, th I want to think again, you know, like, and I think in slop, you know, like I think with materials, I think with junk, I think with arrangements of, you know, that, that are too, I think with the too muchness, and I think that, like, at what point, I'm 47, at what point do you say this is how I am, you know, like, I feel like I've been trying to fix myself for a long time, <laughs> which is maybe why you hear conflict and everything, right, I'm like, I can do that, I can do that better, I can be good, um, and teaching at, at Yale for six years, like, um, it's an environment of extreme, um, goodness <laughs> you know it's like it's very much like ambition and success and you're good you're the best like this word mastery that Kerry James Marshall has kind of like properly you know highlighted and 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 others um, myself included unthinking mastery is this great book by Julietta Singh but I think like all the sort of performances of mastery are I've been I've I've been all the way up the mountain and I've seen the masters and I'm like that's cool you do it that way that's awesome I do it other ways, you know, and I'm like, at what point do I decide that's okay? I don't know. At, at this point, I'm just looking for kin. <laughs> yes? So at what point does something tell you this is going to be a scratch? This is going to be a what? Scratch. Honestly. Oh, geez, those are the hard questions. What point? something tell me this is going to be stretched. I think it's actually all about how much energy I have. It's really fucking hard to make a like double bed sized painting like off the stretcher with materials, put it through the sewing machine. I mean that Notley painting in the sewing machine was like crazy hard. Like it's just exhausting, it's confusing, you can never see it, you never have any perspective. It's totally overwhelming and I'm like I'm gonna get on top of this, I'm gonna get on top of this and like so I think that there's a point where a lot of the time I'm like, I'm just too fucking tired to like make one of those big things. And then it'll probably fail. It probably won't be any good. I mean, the ones that are good, I make so much stuff, you know? But when it's, it's like, I don't even know, like, when is it good? That would take a big enough studio and I don't have that right now, you know? It's part of the gift of this show is being like, huh, some of these are good. Some of them are really bad, but some of them are good. But it takes a big, beautiful space like that to even see anything. Yeah, it's basically just when I have enough energy, and then I'll and then I'll put it on the fucking stretchers, and often I have to take it back off and put it back on, and take it back off and put it back on, and sweep the staples up constantly. And I started finally using the thin staples. Oh, here's Texas. This is for you. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping I'd get to that. 
This is a painting I made years ago that I, it's like I had found the shaped canvas. Somebody else had made that shaped canvas, and I was like, well, that sort of looks like Texas. Now that I've like looked at Texas a little more, I'm like, that looks nothing like Texas. So forgive me for my. That's an abstraction, right? <laughs> um, do we have like one more, one more question? Maybe I know we're out of time. Yes. I think that probably goes all the way back, being from a punk scene, like, you know, I worked in vintage clothing stores and used bookstores, and, um, but moving to New England and really starting to, like, go to, you know, uh, yard sales and find textiles and, like, just getting really into, like, kind of maybe even ugly, like, fussy textile, like, pattern, pattern, like, intensely into pattern living in New England. Like, I'm from the West Coast. It's, very different relationship to aesthetics. Um, and so I just got really into all these patterns and kind of went nuts with it and then I've gotten very sick of it and I don't know. But there's that kind of recycling and just kind of like finding and using. Um, but I also want to say that I was never a very good recycler, like proper, like sorting the trash, you know? And now I live in this very small town called Norfolk in Connecticut, and there's a, we have a transfer station, which is not quite a dump, it's different, but I love it so much. It's like my biggest job in our family of two with a little dog um, is to take the garbage. Like I, I go to the dump, that's my job, transfer station dump, right? Um, Gosh, I don't know, I'm just totally obsessed with the transfer station. There's like a mattress shipping container, there's a, a metals bin, there's a bulky waste bin, there's like a thing for dishwashers, like you can, they, there's something they call Nordstrom's, which is like Nordstrom's, like in Norfolk, which is just like the free shipping container, like which is full of junk that I, you know, every time I stop there. Um, Jimmy runs the, the transfer station and I love Jimmy. And I, you know, we have lots of friends in my very small town who are like, Jimmy's so mean, like, and I'm like, nah, <laughs> no, I love Jimmy. <laughs> oh, he always gives, like he always has a biscuit for Moses because Moses is vicious, he's a Chihuahua Pomeranian. Anyway, like, so everything about recycling has now become really important to me because it's like associated with this place and this activity. Um, I don't know, it's like, it's not some green bin. It's like, I get it now. I guess we have to stop, right? Okay, one more, yes? I mean, it's, it's very important with preparing a talk like this, like what, like you guys, like what I'm thinking about. I'm like, I want to say everything, you know? Like I, I, I'm a terrible editor in every way. I mean, just in terms of like, I can edit writing really well, but not images, not pictures. But um, I'm incredibly concerned, sadly, with the market because I'm in a lull. And, you know, usually I've been able to I don't know, make a certain amount of money every year that supplements my income. And I took this crazy risk of quitting my job. Um, I was like, I just need a break from teaching. And because I wasn't actually tenured, I didn't have sabbaticals. So it had been basically been 15 years of teaching solid um, and having a pretty busy career with shows kind of regularly. And I just felt like, I'm a frantic mess. I don't have any idea who I am or what I'm doing anymore. I'm just like, going to work and telling other people how to make their paintings and I, I'm not very credible. <laughs> like what do I even, what am I doing, you know? Um, 
I think in a very jolly way, I'm like, it's like a midlife crisis. And I'm like, okay, great, time, time for a midlife crisis. Like, you, you gotta have it. So, but the market thing is like, as much as I'm very worried and I'm like, oh, they're just not selling right now, like, I don't know why, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that's, that doesn't really change what I do or how I make. It's just, I'm, again, I'm like, yeah, I'm what I am, you know? Um, and I, th I guess I've just sort of had to resign myself to like trends come and trends go. I was trendy and now I'm not. And okay, you know, maybe I'll be trendy again. I mean, apparently like they love to pick up women when we're 90, you know. I don't think I'm going to live that long. <laughs> My family gets cancer and dies young, but whatever. I don't know. Somebody else will. I've been thinking about like which nieces and nephews I'm going to leave my estate. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. I've had, one, I've had one thought really recently that I'm really excited about, and maybe this is going to sound like, but you know sour grapes, right? It's the old Aesop's fable of, like, the fox can't get to the grapes. I mean, for fuck's sake, like, I have no reason to complain. I'm having this incredible mid-career show, you know, and I have lots of other things going on. I just haven't had a sale in, like, what, six months. Like, it's nothing to complain about. But anyway, I've been thinking about that fox and those grapes and sour grapes and how sour grapes is actually a really meaningful step towards like thinking and I, I, I'm really excited about that actually it's like I wasn't as pretty as I wanted to be when I was young like and so I did something else you know I think like you don't get something and so you do something else and I think that's actually really productive <laughs> or healthy or something I don't know yeah we should probably stop right yeah thank you Thank you for all the amazing questions. I'm really grateful. It's really energizing.